Hey guys, so I wrote a book called In Case I'm Murdered. What you should know about stalking, domestic violence, sexual abuse, and how to stay safe. We're gonna read a little bit of it today because I want to ultimately be able to do this as an audiobook. I haven't gotten that far yet. I do better when I'm listening than when I'm reading. <laughs> I don't sit still really well. And reading takes a long time if you're not a speed reader. For now, we'll just read a little bit and kind of get you an idea of the book. So today we're going to do chapter 8, Protecting Yourself. You have a right to be safe. This is weird because I'm used to talking directly to you and I'm not looking at you hardly at all because I'm reading. So I hope that's okay. Kelly Heron, 36, was training for a marathon. Four miles into an unintended 10-mile run, she stopped to use a public restroom. She recalls becoming aware that something was wrong just before the man who had laid wait in the restroom began attacking her. That man, Gary Steiner, is a 40-year-old registered sex offender in Arizona with an assault history that goes back to the 90s. I just kept screaming, not today, MF, she, she told ABC News. Obviously, she didn't say MF, but that's what I put. She screamed it throughout the attack. It became her battle cry. Kelly had gone through self-defense training. She said it all came back to her during the attack. At one point during the attack, she also recalled thinking, this doesn't have to be a fair fight. And she began scratching his face. Scratching an attacker's face is a natural response, but not one recommended by self-defense expert and author of when violence is the answer, Tim Larkin. However, I believe he would wholeheartedly support the idea she had about it not needing to be a fair fight. While there are obviously things that you can learn about self-defense maneuvers and such, the primary thing I want to address in this chapter is your mindset. As with many other things in life, your brain is your greatest weapon. Social and asocial violence. According to Tim Larkin, there are two types of violence, social and asocial. Social violence at its core deals with social standing. The key identifier for social violence is communication. The violence is used to communicate that the person using it is in control. I believe that much of domestic violence falls into this category. The perpetrator is communicating to you that you are his possession or that he controls your life or maybe just that he is what he believes that a real man is. This kind of violence can be de-escalated or placated when handled in the right way. For example, if someone puts a gun to your head and demands that you give them your money, you can give them your money and potentially make it out of the situation alive. Asocial violence, however, is a different animal. Asocially violent people do not wish to communicate any type of message in asocial violence, a person will stab you or shoot you and leave you to die without a second thought. This person has a singular focus and you do not want to be in the way of them achieving it. I think that people who commit intimate partner homicide fall into this category, especially when it's murder-suicide. They're not going to be reasoned with or de-escalated. They can't be placated. Other examples of asocial violence are school or workplace shootings. There is no reasoning with these people. Their violence is swift and intentional, and you may not even see it coming. In asocial violence, the person's mission is to destroy, not to harm. Note, keep in mind that one type of violence can turn into the other in a flash. Don't assume that because you're dealing with social violence, it cannot become asocial and fast. First things first, when it comes to protecting yourself, the greatest policy is to avoid violence, if at all possible. If it's not possible, I want you to fight like there's no tomorrow. But if you can de-escalate the situation or leave it safely, that is your first choice. If not, the mental battle. Unfortunately, we tend to associate violence with evil and criminals. In the minds of most Americans today, using violence would make us bad people, just like criminals. As a result, the two groups of people who generally study violence, who are ready and able to use it effectively, are professional protectors, like law enforcement, and predators. That puts us common folk at a huge disadvantage. In a life or death situation, we need to be ready and able to use the tool of violence to survive. 
We cannot assume that predators are going to handle the situation the way that we would. They don't think like us. We have to be able to meet them where they are in such a moment. If we're only reacting to someone's violent actions, there's a strong chance that we will die. The quote, failing to plan is planning to fail, is applicable here. That's why our mindset is so important. That's why I strongly recommend that you read When Violence is the Answer for a much needed paradigm shift. Since your perspective dictates your actions, you need to shift your perspective from only bad people use violence to stay off the ground to stay out of the ground. It's also foolish to expect the police to save you. Most violent crime is done in minutes, sometimes seconds. Unless the police officer happens to be close when it goes down and you're able to call for help before the attack begins, the police are more likely to be involved after the attack is over. You have to survive until they can help you. You have to survive. It's interesting to me, as I research for this book, I'm seeing the word predator used with positive connotations. Predator mindset for gymnastics, for self-defense, in business, etc. There are some traits that human predators possess that can be beneficial. Confidence, acting proactively, being persistent, for example. But that's not what I mean when I talk about a predator. The kind of predator I'm referring to is a human who hunts other humans for their prey. There are some animal species that will kill their own kind, but largely it's a form of infanticide for the purpose of maintaining dominance. When it comes to murderous tendencies, humans really are exceptional, says Richard Wrangham, a biological anthropologist at Harvard known for his studies on the evolution of human warfare. I take that to mean that some humans are their own special kind of messed up. Here's an idea for you to chew on. If you are violently attacked after reading this book and you're not mentally ready, you may effectively be participating in your own murder. You have got to take back your power. Criminals don't see themselves as the victim, as the one who's receiving the violence, ever. They only see themselves dishing it out. In any given scenario, they are not thinking about how they can respond to someone else's actions. They're on offense, not defense, and that puts them in control. They don't hesitate. Their actions are fast. They're not distracted by emotions or moral thinking. They're not anticipating what the predator is going to do next or trying to remember what they learned in that one self-defense class they took last year. Larkin says during an attack, we should be thinking, where's my target? What's available to me? And what can I do to inflict a debilitating injury right now? Circumstances can differ, but human anatomy is human anatomy. The truth is that anyone can do debilitating violence to anyone else. Your size, your speed, your strength, your gender, all matter far less than your mindset and your intent, says Tim Larkin. Have the mindset that you're going to survive no matter what. Navy SEALs use the mental tool, pull the trigger. Think of someone you must stay alive for. Picture them in your mind right now. In the future, should a situation happen where someone is trying to use violence against you, immediately bring that face to your mind and know that that means it's time to go because you have to survive for them. This could be your children, parents, spouse, or someone else. The physical attack. One more thing before we leave the mental readiness section. What are you saying to yourself? It's a well-researched fact that whatever you tell yourself becomes true. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So tell yourself, in a life or death fight, I am equal to anyone who tries to attack me. Tim Larkin. Rehearse it in your mind and or out loud. Make it stick. Muscle memory for your brain. You can go to aprilhardy.com to listen to me say affirmations that I recommend. I don't know how great of quality those are because I haven't listened to them in a little while. So if they're not good, let me know. <laughs> and I might re-record them. Inflicting a debilitating injury means breaking something inside of your opponent. Don't just hit them, drive through them. The goal is to produce enough physical trauma to trigger a spinal reflex reaction which causes the brain and the body to focus on the injury. When it does, they can't do anything else. 
It's like when you get hurt and your hands instantly move to hold the injured body part. There are reflex things that a body will do when it's badly injured and it can't do anything else. That means the bad guy can't plan, make decisions, or think about chasing you down so you can get to safety. But it has to be a debilitating injury. Kicking them in the balls, scratching them in the face with your fingernails, or even using your keys as a weapon is probably not enough unless you're going to take that key and drive it through their eyeball. My favorite line from No Bullshit Guide to Women's Self-Defense illustrates the survival mindset well. While talking about biting as a defensive weapon, CRGN says, I truly hope you never have to do this, but if you are pinned and you can't use your arms, it's your only real choice. Bite off his nose and spit it across the room, then latch onto his throat. Zombie foo. <laughs> I still love it. If ever I felt like I was given permission to protect myself, it was with that line. Thank you, CR Jan. Get to know the places to strike, your adversary's physical vulnerabilities, and plan to take advantage of them in time to save your life. There is no protecting yourself in a life or death fight without being willing to use the very same tool of violence that your adversary wants to use against you. Tim Larkin. Soft parts of the body. Don't threaten. Strike without warning to destabilize and detour the threat so that you can escape. Tim Larkin. I'm not certified to teach self-defense. The following are body parts suggested to strike in material that I have read as well as some examples for what you can do with each body part. Please seek professional training in physical self-defense. Easy to perform. Eyes. These can be poked, stabbed, or gouged out of their sockets. Throat. Strike the throat to block your attacker's breathing, causing them to gasp for air. The more power used in this move, the more destructive it is. Life-threatening, potentially. Nose. A palm strike or a punch can cause serious pain and watering of the eyes. Solar plexus, or the breastbone. Drive your open hand through it with all of your weight. Temple, which is this part right here. Arteries that provide blood to the brain are located in the temple. A severe hit can lead to excessive pressure on the brain, oxygen deprivation, and brain damage or death. Groin. Kicking here is obvious and expected by most men. I don't recommend using this move, aka kicking them in the nuts. Toes. You can stomp on them and break them. More difficult to perform. Jaw. A punch to the jaw can knock a person out. Back of the neck or spine. An injury to the spine at any point can cause paralysis and even death. Ribs. A punch or a kick that breaks the ribs will cause a lot of pain and may even incapacitate one of their arms. Ears. Ears can be ripped off with enough pulling force. The eardrums can be ruptured with hard enough hit. Fingers. Bend them back to break. Knees. A kick to the knee straight forward or to the side with all of your weight to break it. It's better if their weight is on the knee that you're attacking. No matter what you do, don't just do it a little. Drive your whole body through your attacker at whichever point you choose to or are able to. Self-defense. You are not responsible for the things that people choose to do to you. It is their choice, not yours. But a life without the ability to affect it would be pretty frightening. Although I am not qualified to teach any type of physical self-defense, there are things that you can do to reduce the likelihood of being victimized. That kind of self-defense I can help you with. First, we'll look at what makes you an easy target, and then at things you can do to be safer. What makes you an easy target? There are four things. One, complacency. Two, predictability. Three, obliviousness. Four, routine. These are commonly described as being on autopilot, behavior that you do consistently and automatically. Habits can make you a target. Be aware of what you do. What makes you a difficult target? One, use situational awareness. That's like the number one thing that people recommend. Be observant. You need to be aware of what's going on around you, especially after dark and when you're by yourself. Don't wear headphones. 
Don't be looking down at your phone or even looking down when you're out, especially during those times, like after dark and when you're by yourself. People who do these things are effectively deaf and blind. Deaf and blind prey is pretty hard to resist for predators, both random ones and familiar ones. Two, own a dog. People tend to second guess their intention or rationalize situations. Animals don't do that. When they sense a predator, they respond accordingly. In fact, don't just own a dog, imitate their behavior. Three, keep all of your senses open while you're in public. Sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. Four, lock your windows, home and auto. Five, keep your windows shut and locked at night. Six, have home exterior lights on at night. Seven, use home and auto security systems if you are so inclined. If you can't afford one, get a dog. Eight, guard your personal information. Nine, change your routines and routes as much as you can. Be unpredictable. 10, pay attention to your intuition. 11, walk and move with confidence in the fact that you are willing and able to use the tool of violence if necessary. It will show. 12, be aware of how you present yourself and how you interact with strangers. Are you presenting clear boundaries or are you clearly a pushover who's more concerned with other people's feelings than your own safety? Opportunistic predators look for easy targets, but these ideas and the ones to follow will be noticed by opportunistic predators and those living alongside of you as well. Dangerous places. Danger zones where you are most likely to be attacked are parking garages, laundry rooms, elevators, stairwells, alleys, hiking or running trails, ATMs, parking lots, outside of bars, and inside of your own home. Safety tips for relationships. A gentleman will be careful to maintain an appropriate distance, but some creeps get off on making girls uncomfortable and will close the distance and may even attempt to put their hands on you. This is unacceptable and you need to tell them in no uncertain terms to back off. CR Jam. Decide on clear boundaries that others are not allowed to cross right now, like do it right now. How close is too close to be walking near or behind you? How close is someone allowed to sit by you when there are other options? Predators and creeps don't follow the same rules that we do. Don't expect them to. Don't worry about being rude. If someone comes into your personal space without your permission, then they are being rude. You can and should remove yourself from the situation and not feel bad about it. You're under no obligation to be polite or friendly to strange men who approach you on the street, especially if they present as arrogant or creepy. Don't second guess your intuition. It is your best pre-violence warning signal. Be careful not to give strangers personal information that they can use to track you down. I know it sounds really negative and distrustful, but you need to be careful with who you trust anyway. In this social media world that we live in, information is way too readily available. Strangers don't need to know where you work, what building you live in, what kind of car you drive, or what you do in your free time. With just a dollar and a name, strangers can access a lot of personal information on you. who have done it to others. And they can fish for information through Facebook and Google for free. Has it ever seemed like when you're nice to guys, they assume that you want to screw them? That's a phenomenon that my friends and I have noticed for years. For some guys, smiling, laughing, and being concerned about their feelings, aka not wanting to be rude, feels like you've established a connection with them. To them, it means that you like them, and they may fixate on you or stalk you. What's worse is that if you then try to set them straight, they'll take it as you were leading them on. That can lead to violence because they feel like they've been jerked around or rejected which is crazy and stupid, but some people are just like that. The safest thing to do is to immediately and definitively let a guy or a girl know that you are not interested and that they need to leave you alone. Finally, don't unnecessarily provoke others. The easiest example of this is road rage. Don't curse at someone in traffic or follow them with your brights on because they don't know what you want them to do. It's not worth starting something. You don't know what kind of a person that they are. Drive away.
your habits, and your safety. When it comes to your personal safety, it's a good idea to consider very dangerous situations and what you would do ahead of time. This type of mental preparation is used by many people, including athletes. Your brain can't tell the difference between what you actually experience and what you just think. So the more that you go through it in your mind, the less you will freak out if it actually happens. Then, if the situation happens, you will be more prepared to assess the situation and your resources to make it out alive. If you walk regularly, vary your walking routine. Plan out a few different routes to take. Mark out safe houses in your mind at intervals along the way. In the event of an attack, you can stop at these shops or homes where you know that you will be safe. Incorporate safe houses every time you vary your route. If you're being followed, abruptly change directions. Stay in a well-lighted area and seek safety in, in a public building. Make noise and attract lots of attention to yourself and the person that is following you. If you are captured and thrown into the trunk of a car, experts advise that you kick out the taillights, stick your arm out of the hole, and start waving wildly. The driver won't be able to see you, but the people behind the car will. This trick is said to have saved lives. When you're getting into your own vehicle, look into it to make sure that nobody is inside of it, particularly in the back seats. Once you're in, lock the doors. Use taxis and valet parking as opposed to walking at night or being vulnerable in a parking garage. Cover poles in doors and cameras of phones and devices when you don't want to be seen. All of them can be used to spy on you. If you carry a purse, make sure that it's in good condition and that it has a long strap and multiple compartments for easy organization. To use your purse as a mini go bag, you can make sure that the following are included in it. A compact but powerful LED flashlight, which you should test often, spare batteries, a spare pocket knife, a bandana, and pepper spray or pepper foam. Keep a spare key and cash or a credit card somewhere that is accessible to you besides your purse. Tip, cleavage comes in really handy for this. Just saying. Weapons recommendations by CR Jan. Mace pepper foam and the Kimber Pepper Blaster as pepper spray tools because they are effective, easy to use, and usable indoors. A heavy set of keys on a lanyard flung into someone's face can work if you're in places where pepper spray is not allowed. For pocket knives, he recommends the brands Spyderco, Kenshaw, and Benchmade. He also suggests that you not depend on a pocket knife that costs less than $30. A lot of folks think of a knife as primarily a weapon, but it is not. It is a tool that can be used for a variety of chores, and that is what you will tell officer friendly you carry it for, if asked. CR Jan. My life correlation. At the time of this experience, I was well aware that my ex-husband had been watching me. He was military trained and could shoot me from a distance, leaving little evidence behind. I had visions of myself being shot in the head more often than I want to recall. Whether I was awake or asleep, I was afraid most of the day. One day, I got to work and got busy with my duties. I cleaned houses for a living. I was at one end of the house and I heard a noise at the other end. When it didn't stop, I knew I needed to investigate. To my knowledge, I was the only one there. As I got closer, terror came over me. I realized that the noise was a vacuum running. Since it couldn't have turned itself on, I knew instantly that he was there. He had followed me to work, and the vacuum was a tool to draw me out. Would he shoot me on sight? Would he come from behind me and slit my throat? Would I ever see my kids again? I kept walking towards the vacuum as those thoughts whirled around in my head as if I had no control over my own body. But I didn't see him. Why would he still be hiding at this point, I wondered. I shut off the vacuum and searched the house, unarmed. And when I found nothing, I reluctantly went back to work. I paid attention to every sound in the house the rest of the time that I was there that day. I was highly vigilant as I went to my car too. I was not operating in a survival mindset. In the short paragraphs I just gave you about the situation, can you see how many times I mentally laid down and died? I don't believe that the situation would have turned out better if I would have been armed 
and he had actually been there that day, weapon or not, my mindset was going to get me killed. In his book, When Violence is the Answer, Tim Larkin says that when you're thinking in fight or survival mode, anything can be a weapon. And when you're not, it doesn't matter if you have a weapon. You won't use it effectively. If you're being attacked or being hunted, make no mistake, your opponent is thinking in fight mode. It will be used against you. I would have likely died that day if my ex-husband had, had really been there. You have to get your head in the game. Your life and your children's lives, if you have them, depend on it. If you want to spend more time on your mindset, and I recommend that you do, When Violence is the Answer spends the first half of the book on it. It's a great resource. Key points. 1. Social violence is violence that's used to communicate dominance in a social situation or a relationship. A school bully is an example of social violence, as is domestic violence frequently. They're communicating that they are in control. 2. Asocial violence is swift and intentional. The mission is to destroy, not to harm, and not to communicate a message. 3. Violence is an amoral tool. Using violence to stay alive and to protect others doesn't make you a bad person. It is a necessary tool. If someone is coming at you with a large knife or a gun, you wouldn't take out a balloon sword to fight them. That would be an ineffective tool. You need to be ready and able to use the tool of violence with people who only know how to use violence. 4. Avoid or evade violent situations first, if it's possible. 5. The best weapon is mental readiness. With the right frame of mind, anything can be a weapon. With the wrong frame of mind, you can lay down and die mentally before the fight even begins, even if you have a weapon. 6. Criminals don't see themselves as a victim. They're playing offense. They don't think about how to react to you. They think about what they're going to do to you. Reacting puts you at a disadvantage. 7. Violence usually happens fast. Law enforcement is more likely to be there for the cleanup than to save you. Unless law enforcement officers are there as the violence is occurring, you need to be able to save yourself. 8. Circumstances differ. Anatomy doesn't. Base your self-defense strategy on that fact. 9. Don't strike to hit. Strike to drive through. Break something in them. 10. These things make you easy prey. Complacency, predictability, obliviousness, and routine. 11. When wild animals become aware of a predator, they run or they employ their defenses. People don't. They justify and rationalize. Stop it! 12. Creeps and predators operate outside of society's rules. They don't think like you. Don't expect them to. You have to respond on their terms. 13. You are under no obligation to be polite or friendly when you don't feel comfortable with someone. Thank you, Thank you for listening to Chapter 8 of In Case I'm Murdered. Get your copy and let me know what you think about doing like a group reading together. I would love to connect with you guys there. Until next time, stay safe.